in half an hour. Broadway Danny Rose. I don't believe this. He's drunk. He's got the evil eye. He cheated us. She's no better. Woody Allen and Mia Farrow on the run from the Mafia hitmen. Keep wriggling. Don't stop now. <laughs> she betrayed me with him. Danny Rose. A town rebuilds itself in Afghanistan. The struggle against crack in Harlem. Reflections on a decade in India. And to start the series, a mother's survival in drought-ridden Africa. An updated series of Global Report begins this Friday at 8.20 on BBC Two. to a celebration of a successful two-year campaign to change the lives of 200 disabled children abandoned in a castle in Romania. The relief effort has been coordinated in Bristol and on the second anniversary of their country's revolution, the Children's Choir of Romania came to the city for a special thank you. In a church in Bristol, relief workers hear a Romanian tribute to their achievements. The city's people have been at the front line of a two-year campaign to deliver children from a wretched existence in a Transylvanian castle, where only now the revolution is taking effect. of Eastern Europe two years ago, Romania's revolution toppled a ruthless dictator and ended 40 years of communism. In the euphoria that followed, no one could predict the terrible secrets that were to be revealed. Within a fortnight, convoys from Britain rolled in with essential aid. Several thousand lorries have continued to arrive ever since. The drivers were bringing supplies to a country which was desperately short of almost everything. For 20 years, imports had been virtually banned. The country closed to the outside world. But it was a Transylvanian castle set above a remote village which the Romanian authorities now acknowledge had the worst of conditions. What it contained was 200 disabled children who'd been virtually abandoned. These boys were malnourished and covered in sores and excrement. The staff were few and untrained, food and medicines minimal. In a country where care was a low priority, these boys were bottom of the heap. Oh, it was terrible. It was very hard for me because For my heart, when I see these children without clothes, without uh, water, without electricity, without everything, and it was cold in the rooms and, and smelled bad, and they were such, such some small animals. It was very, very hard. I think a week I just cry and I cry and I cry and I go home and I tell to my husband, look what I see, look what is it, look. A convoy of aid from Swindon travelled across northern Romania 
a route other relief efforts had largely missed. The lorries found their aid was welcomed. In this village, people were glad to take the clothes and food on offer. Everyone was short of the most basic goods. And they stored the supplies in the incongruous splendor of their church, lovingly maintained by a deeply religious people. But it was at the castle that the convoys found their aid was most urgently needed. In those early chaotic days, goods from the outside world were such a novelty and people so impoverished that villagers grabbed supplies, ignoring the needs of the hospital. Everyone wanted something for themselves. At the time, it's thought almost half the aid didn't reach the children. But the help was not to be limited to a few lorry loads. The children's condition so moved the outside world that a long-term strategy was conceived to transform their lives. Two years later, those responsible for the plan, a team from Bristol Mencap, have returned to see how well it's worked. This was their first chance to meet the castle's new director, there have been three in the last two years. Running the castle is not an easy task, and this one has ideas of his own about what the children need. For Mencap, their job was even more daunting, trying to improve the lives of 200 children who live nearly 2,000 miles away in a medieval castle. Also in the vans is a Norwegian delegation who've been fundraising in their country with the aim of building the children a new purpose-built home. It's their and Mencap's ultimate goal, to move the children out of the castle. All those coming back had worked at the castle in the past two years. Norwegian physiotherapist Per Josdal helped right from the start of the relief effort. Many of the children's bodies had become wasted through lack of use. Mike Bell has become a key member of the Mencap team. This is the mischievous little one. Here he is, and the other one. Hi, how are you? Okay, okay. The new director shows Mencap's Pam Hannam and Pauline Lyons, the two coordinators of the project, the visible results of two years of hard work. The castle is brighter and cleaner, its basic infrastructure overhauled, and there's more staff. The director also encourages increased communication between nurses and children. Make so something with the name of the children and the birthday to know that for even it's for the staff to help the staff to make the connection better, the intimate connection between the children and the staff. The contrast with the degradation of two years ago is remarkable. These boys, the most disabled, were also the most pitiful. Now the hospital looks much more like a place where children can live. by himself and we've just been trying there. Very good. Very good. Boom, boom. Here, hold the puppy. He's beginning to come out of his trance. 
trauma, if you like, and do things for himself. Before he just used to sit in the corner, he was good. So the staff did nothing for him. Now they've got enough staff to work with him, and it's beginning to show results. <laughs> Mike has been working on a special project for the last six months. Two years ago, Menkap's initial task was to get the children cleaner and healthier. Now comes the next step, a chance to go to school. This is the contribution from Mike and a group of Bristol Venture Scouts. They took an old, disused Bristol classroom and dismantled it, bit by bit. Then they packed it up and transported it, all the way to Romania. There they rebuilt it in the grounds of the castle and filmed its construction on their own video. this building we heard of men caps need to get the building down within a limited space of time or else it would be lost we had four weeks to organize five lorries work out the uh, quantity of timber and materials and paints and services that we need I don't know how the comradeship happens it just happens I suppose when you've got seven days to put that together in there isn't time really to think about little squabbles and little irritations. You've just got to sink in and go. They started work at 7 in the morning and finished at 10 at night under floodlights. You get surprised at the motives. You say to one youngster, why are you coming? Oh, it'll be a giggle. That's the surface. You get him an hour later and you say to him, why are you really coming? Oh, come on, Mike, look what we've, we've got. Look at what we've got. Our houses, our homes, our activities. What have they got? And yeah, I would think without doubt you could interview any one of them and get the same story. Do you like to come in? In the classroom, a group of teenage boys receive their first taste of education. If we can get the lads to sit down at their places. Away from the crowded castle rooms, they're the subject of special attention. The teachers are care workers from Cornwall, who've also been passing on their skills to the Romanian staff. Hello, Florin. Yanchi. The boys are the same ones who two years ago were left to fend for themselves in a squalid castle room. An image from Dickensian times, but it was happening at the end of the 20th century. Do you have another one? Which one are you going to have? Ah, Fermier. A lot of them were listless, lacked any energy didn't seem to want to explore their surroundings. Many of them just sat and did nothing at all, which meant that their senses, the development of their senses, just hadn't happened. And many of them showed no initiative to explore their environment at all. They've responded very well. When we first brought them to the classroom one week ago, they spent a lot of their time just exploring the classroom because it was a new situation to them. They went round feeling things, the sorts of things you'd expect a much younger child to do. By the end of the week, we are able to get them to colour. We were able to get them to cut the various things they were colouring out and to actually glue what they had coloured on a piece of paper. And you see the results 
around the classroom because we felt it was important to put their work up and that, to show them that we valued what they'd done. One of the big aims of our teams has been to observe and assess the children with the Romanian staff in the knowledge that we know some of the, people, some of the children are not mentally handicapped and this is what we found already. One crucial step in the development of care and education can be measured by these four boys who've been taken from the castle and put into a special school in the centre of a large town. They're almost part of the community. But in Romania overall, the picture's not so good. The new generation are being born into a country where old hardships remain, and the struggles to achieve the goals of the revolution continue. Christmas, Romania still needs the convoys from Western Europe. child was left here this morning by his parents. He's three years old, but he can't walk or talk, and he's the size of a baby. He only got his place here because another child, a paralyzed child, died. But it's much more unusual now for places to become free, and that's because the death rate has dropped dramatically. More often now, children are turned away. Tibor Moldovan, a gypsy child, now faces an institutional life inside the castle. He'd been on a waiting list to come here. His parents are poor with three other children. They couldn't cope with a fourth disabled child. They only have eight family planning centres, and they, of course, are all in the big towns. So there is no access yet to family planning for people who live outside the main towns. And under Ceausescu, of course, the, the women used to have to be examined to make sure that they weren't, in fact, using contraceptives that they were not having abortions. They were not allowed to have an abortion until they'd had five babies. I, I, it makes my blood curdle to think about it, that this policy was inflicted on this wretched country and these poor women who had a fight to keep their children, they had to go back to work early because they were so impoverished that they couldn't afford to look after their children and therefore they did tend to say, right, state has made me have children, you can look after them. And that is why the orphanages have got something like 130,000 children in them. <laughs> These children have done nothing. They need support. 
and it is not their fault they were born. It was the fault of a, a, an insane system. But they're here now, and we really shouldn't make them suffer because of the disgusting policies of their elders. <laughs> This is something completely new. Special playrooms where the children's undeveloped minds and bodies are given stimulation. They're six and seven years old, but can't even talk. The thing that we can leave behind is a training program, is training. That will stay. The training that we do will stay, and that is something positive that we can leave behind when the lorries have stopped, when the resources have stopped, and when Romania starts to be able to produce the things that it needs. The love, the care, the things that we've taught them, the things that aren't tangible, because this is a society where status counts, where material things count. We've tried to say that the things, the love and the care are the things that count. We've tried to show that to them. We started off getting the children clean and warm and fed because we're practical people and people don't want to pick up and cuddle a child that, that isn't clean. So we have kept to very basic things. The disinfectant, the soap powder, the washing machines, the toilets, the showers, the food and now the training. We've kept to very basic things. We don't give presents, we don't give holidays, we don't give anything we expect some return. The return we expect is that the staff will work harder with the children and value the children. We don't expect anything else. But the transformation of the children's lives is something that's remote from the minds of people who live just down the hill. On this day, hundreds of them, Romania's ethnic Hungarians, came to the castle grounds. Not to see the children, but to remember a great Hungarian poet. These people are not used to such public events, for under the dictator Ceausescu, their culture was suppressed. As for what was in the castle, the children were little more than a curiosity. The man they were remembering was the former baron of the castle, who lived here when it was his family's private home. For the baron's son, this was only the second time in 40 years that he'd returned. His family were driven out by the communists when he was a child. Some of the castle children were at the ceremony too, but not a part of it. They sat on a bank, uninvited guests, overlooking the proceedings. For them, the crowds and ceremony were a strange affair, for it was the first time in decades that the public in any numbers had been allowed inside the castle grounds. Well, it was uh, a very nice, a very good home. It's a little bit big, but uh, I think uh, we had a lot of uh, good moments we had in this castle and we loved to live here. This was a center of the, uh, the Transylvanian literature. Writers came here, and the actors, the painters, and it was a very good thing for us to see a lot of well-known people here. During the early part of the century, Bucharest was known as the Paris of Central Europe. For aristocratic and wealthy families, Romania, then a monarchy, was an essential stop on the grand tour of Europe. Then all cultures were openly celebrated. It was a time of tolerance and patronage, when art and music flourished. I was a child here, you know. So to see other, others with this condition, it's for me, of course. Huh? But it's a great thing that they had a home. Yeah. 
But I think not this place, it's other one. It's something with, with color and with uh, small little houses or something like this, I think. I don't, I don't know, I'm not a psychologist. This castle is not for these children, but it's for the cultural things or for hotel or something, but it's, uh, it's, it's like a, a Dracula castle, so it's not for uh, children, it's, no. If the castle does become a hotel, it'll be a new role for the medieval fortress. Already it's gone from being an aristocratic home and a haven for artists to a dumping ground for disabled children, which the state then forgot. From that, it's just beginning to emerge. But as Romania struggles to shake off its grim past, instead of order, there's been turbulence clashes and confrontations between government and people. Well, they've been very short of cash and they still are because their economy is shot to pieces and they haven't really got it going again yet. So it is going to be difficult for them to find that bit of spare which we've got in the West and we have used in the West to help people who cannot help themselves. But it, it is very difficult for all the people in Eastern Europe who got financial difficulties, economic difficulties. It's going to be very difficult for them. Please. Some of the staff are resentful that the conditions in the castle were exposed to the world, believing they are held to blame. They were put under the spotlight, then told to change their attitudes and the way they worked, all the while being scrutinized by Western eyes. Nobody likes change. Change is upsetting. A lot of changes going on in Romania at the moment. They have got problems with the government at the moment. They've got a new director. They're being asked to work three shift system, which they've not done before. They're being asked to clock in at the security gate. It must all make them feel extremely insecure. And uh, because they don't do any management training in this country, at least I don't think they do, the management skills which would help get this smoothly to staff are sometimes a bit perhaps lacking. And they're being asked to make a leap, really, from the 18th century into the modern world and the care of mentally handicapped children, which is totally foreign to their nature. They've never really believed that they were people who were put away to die, to rot gradually. Rotting gradually, the same boy two years ago, living then without hope in a forgotten castle. Medieval castle is, is quite useless to keep children in. We're looking for a new site, but that, of course, is going to cost a lot of money. They have made great strides. The cages have gone. The, the total despair has gone. And the children are now mostly lively, difficult to keep into control. Uh, and that is great to see. And it's, uh, that, that's good hope, I think, for the future. I love the children and, and they love me and it's, it's a good feeling when, when they came and some of them say for me mama, mother and mother I love you and it's, it's, it's a good feeling. Now we can play with these children, we can teach them, we, can, we have time to, to, to teach them to know that they are uh, human beings and they are not animals, how they was before. And how do you see the future here? The future? Oh, it's just a dream. <laughs> what would you like to see? A new hospital with small rooms, just some beds in a room. A small family. A family condition, I, I would like to see.
and Jim Keltner 